Hello and welcome to the video. This is a quick video on how to get a flight controller ready to put inside something like this Hobby King Bixler. Uh, the Bixler's back in stock in Hobby King, I'm very pleased to say. I've ordered this one. I learned to fly on Bixlers, many pilots did. It is a spectacular trainer uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there's no prop at the front, the prop's here at the back. So that means that when you fly into stuff, you don't immediately destroy the motor, the prop and the motor mount. And it also takes an awful lot of abuse and they're not expensive. So I've got myself this one here and I'm actually gonna put iNav in it because why not? Uh, probably stick HDFPV here on the nose as well. And it's an opportunity for me to show you how to configure the flight controller. I'm gonna use a SpeedyB F405 wing for this particular video and how easy it is to set up. I was gonna do an entire series on how you configure iNav8, but actually the series that I've already done, and I'll link to it below, every single step is going to be identical. There's only a couple of wrinkles and that is in the iNav configuration and I'll cover those in this video. After this one, I'm going to put the flight controller in here. I'm going to kind of post it with a bit of double-sided foam tape in there, uh, configure it because this flight controller has a remote USB cable. I can stick this on the side so I can hide the flight controller away and still plug into it if I want to change any of the settings. So for those of you that have been asking, quite a few have been in touch and saying, could you show us how to set up iNav 8 on a plane? watch this video, but then go back and watch all of the INAF for Beginners series link below because the way you set up the radio, the way you wire the flight controller, how you install it into the plane, how you set up all the flight control surfaces and trim everything and then ultimately tune it is still exactly the same. INAV 8 has come on from INAV 7 in several key ways, but in terms of the basic configuration of setup, pretty much exactly the same. So let's go on the bench, look at the flight controller and go through the setup process. So the way I like to set this stuff up, and you've probably seen me do it a lot if you are a regular viewer of the channel, thank you for watching, is that I like to set everything up on the desk like this. Make sure everything works and then when I put it in the plane, if something then doesn't then subsequently work, I know that I've messed up installation or plugged something in wrong with somewhere that it shouldn't be. Now, this is how it is all connected. It looks really complicated. It looks like kind of a exploded spider, but it's actually pretty simple. Let's go through this. Again, this is the SpeedyB F405 wing app. The cool thing is, is that these aren't particularly expensive. Uh, it's about 40 bucks. And in the manual, it shows you how everything connects. Now we're gonna use an SBUS receiver for this particular setup. It's gonna plug into these ports here. That's actually this cable here going into this um, older receiver, just for the way that I'm gonna set this older plane up. And if you wanted to do CRSF, you plug it into these four pins and that's what that's showing here in the manual. These manuals are really, really well laid out. They really help you put everything together. So that's the receiver. The SBUS connection is coming in here. This additional cable, the reason that that's there is I want smart port telemetry going back to the receiver. That means I can use the iNav Lua script on the radio, see my videos on setting up Lua scripts. That then will allow me to get information about number of satellites, distance direction to home, battery status, heights, speed, all that information on the screen of my radio. Handy when you're waiting for the GPS to lock, but if you're flying line of sight and you're looking at the plane, it's also handy to have alerts set up so that if you go too high, the radio will let you know. Other things here, we have the GPS and the um, compass connected. So that's what all these wires are. Uh, it goes into this port here at the end. I love these flight controllers because every single one of the ports is labeled plus you get all these cables in the kit so you can make up what you need without getting too carried away. This is actually a Matex SIS um, GPS and compass unit here. I use lots of different ones. I think there's a HGLRC one at the moment that I'm using for lots of things. There is an arrow at the front that needs to point towards the front of the plane when you install it. But apart from that, it's pretty easy and straightforward. Next bit is this little bit here. This can go this is what I was talking about in the introduction. This can go on the side, has my USB cable, has the buzzer, also has the button to put it into boot mode if I want to flash it and it isn't doing that automatically. That's a nice thing. It means this can be hidden away and this can be at the side. Last couple of things. Um, 
for ease of installation, sometimes I do this, not always, rather than directly solder the ESC to the flight controller, because I sometimes move these rigs about, which is what this actually is. It lives in a box on my bench. Uh, I have a couple of them. There's another one in there. And when I want to add INAV to a plane, it's kind of all ready to rock and roll. I have added XT60 connectors, one to go to the battery, and the other one is just gonna plug into the ESC, and I don't have to unsolder everything. Unfortunately, those things have had to be soldered on. It's not a disaster, but you know what? If you can do all this on the bench, it's much easier and than trying to do it when you are playing around later on. The only last cable on here is this one. Uh, this is the one for the FPV kit. Uh, this is the way that I tend to do it. So it's set up so that there's an SBUS input on here as well, but I've terminated it into a JST lead. That's gonna be the power connector for the Walksnell unit that I'm gonna probably add later on. And then I terminate the transmit and receive pair into a little DuPont style servo connector. And then on the other end of the Walksnell unit, there's the same thing. And if I get it the wrong way round, transmit isn't connected to receive, etc. I can just switch the plug over and plug it in and fix that. So that's how it's all connected together. The really nice thing is, is because it's written on here what each of the pins are, I can see at a glance what UART is which. And another reason why I like these kind of flight controllers is because here in the manual, uh, underneath all the bits and pieces, we have the actual mapping. So we can see here UART1 is for the Express LRS receiver, UART2 is the SBUS stuff, uh, UART 3 is the GPS, UART 4 we can use whatever we want, UART 5 is for the DJI OSD stuff. So this makes it super easy to configure and if you were using iNav 8.0 it can be incredibly handy to do this. Now a big tip when we are playing with this stuff is when you are going to flash it on the bench I wouldn't flash it with everything connected. I normally just to make sure it all works is disconnect the GPS, disconnect the receiver why do I do that? Well, sometimes you can have issues flashing a flight controller if other things are plugged in. It depends on the flight controller, but it's a good habit to get into just to unplug these other things because sometimes the computer is trying to talk through the flight controller to other things and it just all messes up. So I'm just gonna plug this into the computer. The cool thing is, is that if the receiver and the GPS were connected, they will be powered as well. Now with that set, we can download the latest version of iNav Configurator to flash it to the latest version of iNav. This is the current version as I'm recording this, 8.01. If you zoom all the way down here and see all 16 assets, you can see that we have it for Linux, we can have it for Mac and also Windows 6432. I download the Windows 64 stuff as a zip file and then unzip it and then you're ready to run it. With iNav Configurator, started on your computer we're ready to actually flash the firmware if we're going to firmware flasher there's a good chance these days it will actually identify the target that you need check the documentation for the flight controller you have we need to pick the version that we want 8.01 seems pretty good to me and then we're going to load the firmware online and then we're going to click flash firmware this is standard stuff you've seen it in loads and loads of different videos if you're used to flashing beta fly or anything like that or old versions of iNav all of this should be feeling incredibly normal once it's raised it's going to flash the flight controller with iNav it'll then verify it and then when we start it it's going to ask us an extra couple of questions and i would recommend we'll plug everything in just so that we can confirm when we come back when it's powered we can make sure that all those settings are okay so here on the computer, here we are flashing. Doesn't take very long at all. Just let sit and let it go through the entire process. Again, if you are struggling to flash flight controller, my advice would be unplug things like the GPS, the Express LRS or the Crossfire receiver, things like that. Just unplug them, get them out of the way. That tends to fix it. If it still doesn't work, then see my video on the Zadig tool. So there we are, we have now verified. We're going to give it just a second just to finish. The single light flashing here means we are in DFU mode or device firmware update. It's come back as COM7. I'm going to unplug it from the computer. I'm going to replug in the GPS. 
So with the flashing done, we can connect to it for the very first time. And we're going to be asked a couple of questions. The first one is going to be this one. What is it going to be installed in? We're going to say airplane with a tail. That's going to then set quite a few of the default settings and then reboot the flight controller. And when it comes back, it's going to ask, ask us which ports the GPS connected to and which is the receiver. Now the receiver wizard is set for CRSF. We need to set it for S bus in UART2. Uh, this is one of the new wizard things that's been added. This is one of the very few differences. GPS wizard is correct. That's where it's plugged in. All those defaults will be fine. Most of the time, the defaults that you're going to get in here are going to be the right ones. It'll reboot now the final time. And when it comes back, it's going to look like a plane in the configurator. And we can now crack on. From here on in, the configuration is identical to the one that is in the rest of the series. First job is going to go through a calibration, click on calibrate accelerometer, and then click on each of the six positions of the flight controller. Do that. Be super careful when you're doing that and in loading somebody else's diff all or dump from uh, another INAV configuration. Lots of the time people don't remove the accelerometer calibration detail and you're copying that in. So go through this now, but also if you're going to be importing someone else's settings, I would redo the calibration. This is why I like doing it here on the bench because it's easy to move it around. If it's inside a plane, you're going to have to do that longhand. Next job then is the mixer. The mixer is going to show us how the outputs are configured. By default, motor output is going to be on servo one, and then servos three, four, five, and six are going to be the other servos. And you can see here, they've actually showing you which way everything is going to be installed. In terms of the outputs, the outputs by default are not turned on. I would keep the ESC protocol as standard for this particular plane. It's not a modern ESC. I doubt it's going to be running D-Shot, but the very last thing you're going to do when it's in the plane is enable the motor and servo output so you can do that stuff. Ports, most of the configuration has been done. Uh, so that is good news. The MSP display port stuff hasn't been set. And I would also enable the stuff so that I can have uh, smart port back to the receiver. Next one is a configuration tab. A couple of things I would change in here. Uh, I would turn on the CPU based serial ports so that I can configure that as smart port. And then I would also turn on permanently enable launch mode. Those of you that watch my stuff, this is going to feel incredibly normal. And what you do is you just kind of work your way through these tabs on the left hand side, setting it up in exactly the same way as you would with something like iNav7. There isn't really any differences in terms of the configuration from here on in. Next one then is failsafe. Set it to return to home. Save and reboot for that. The only other things that I changed then is something like advanced tuning. Advanced tuning, I would set the default throttle because I like it running when um, I do my auto launch stuff. I like a nice, healthy uh, acceleration on the prop. So I would save and reboot that. Receiver, come in here, make sure that the radio is moving in the right way. Make sure that the channel order is right as well. And that you have, when the receiver is not connected to the radio, that that little fail safe icon appears here at the top. Modes set up as you would expect. I would typically set channel five for arming these days, which is the kind of default for most things, including things like Express LRS. And then I would usually have Horizon as my low position on channel six, which is going to be my mode channel on the radio, middle channel position, potentially have manual, that's kind of fun. And the high position I would have as something like return to home, which is going to be down here somewhere. And we get it because we have the GPS configured. Speaking of the GPS, it's up here and it's nice and blue. That means that the GPS is not only connected, but is configured correctly. Last couple of things, the on-screen display tab by default will be for an analog system. Don't forget when you are flashing things with iNav, reload the analog font manager, go and flash the fonts onto the flight controller. It doesn't use that if it's going to be something else. By default, 
it's going to not give you any of the options for a HDFPV system. We're going to have to set that up in the ports. So if I go back into ports and have a look at the outputs again, then we can see that all we need is actually UART5 is for that stuff. So if we set up UART5 for MSP display port, click save and reboot. Now, when we go into the on-screen display tab, we're going to have the options for all the HD stuff. It'll default to HD0, but I can quickly change that to DJI or Avatar. So if we go into on-screen display, I can select Avatar, and then I have the option to drag around all the different pieces to be where I want it to be. And the red lines and the purple lines are showing me where I need to avoid to make sure that I'm not putting things on screen in a place where they're not going to be seen. Once that's done, save it. And that is pretty much all that I would do. The only big things now is to just take one last look at the mixer and the outputs that is going to tell me where I need to plug in my servos motor is going to be in output one and then the servos are going to go into s3 s4 s5 and s6 and that's pretty standard stuff so there you have it that is the flight controller configured now the next thing to do would be to plug in the controls into the outputs that iNav has already pre-configured and go through the rest of the pieces. So if you wanna jump back into the iNav for beginners list, again, link down below, you can just follow all of the steps. Um, I'm actually quite excited to get this all put together. It's probably been seven, maybe eight years since I've had a Bixler in my fleet. Um, and I'll be honest, I've missed it. So if I do a flight video, I might actually do like a modern review like I do with this uh, with this thing. It's kind of fun to look through it with modern eyes. So thanks for watching. Best of luck with your iNav build. And now hopefully you've seen, it's actually pretty much exactly the same as the way I did it in iNav 7, iNav 6, iNav 5. You get the idea. Thank you for watching my video. Check out the playlist and adding Payless 360 to your search terms will help you find my content. If you haven't done so already, please hit the like and subscribe button. It helps a lot. You can support the time I spend here answering questions and helping others by using the links in the video description.